you to Joe, to Stephanie and Lynn for really staking out so clearly you know, what, what we're up against, what's, what's at stake in what's going on um, in terms of sexist stereotypes, in terms of what's happening with children, um, the ability of lesbians to determine their own boundaries. Uh, so, you know, that really explains why we're here, what's so pressing and urgent about this issue of changes to the Gender Recognition Act, and also the culture that has, out of which these changes are proposed. I also want to thank every sister who has made this event happen. Uh, you all know who you are, uh, especially to Raquel for chairing, who has had so much flack <laughs> flung at her um, over her decision to chair this meeting, and I am so grateful. <laughs> And also to every one of you who's in this room, who's come to hear respectfully what our speakers have had to say, and also hopefully to have your say. I'm going to talk briefly about how I got into this, you know, how I fell down what is sometimes called the rabbit hole of these ideas, um, what Women's Place in the UK stands for, why our demands are important, and what you can do um, if you support us to help us advance those demands. Um, so, let me just start with how did I get into this. So about five years ago, um, around that time there were a lot of high profile stories of historic sexual abuse. I mean, I guess nothing really changes ever, does it? But you may remember you know, Jimmy Savile and various other things going on, and there was a, a lot of women were raising their voices and talking more and more about the experience of male violence. Um, so that was happening on one side, and then on the other side I noticed that women's events were being shut down. Women's events were being criticised and shut down because they were women only or because of their subject matter. One of those conferences was organised by a wonderful feminist organisation in Manchester, um, and they really came under a kind of concerted attack on social media and criticism that they were transphobic. And what was their crime? What had they done wrong? Well, they wanted, in what was actually a trans-inclusive conference, so in that conference, people who are not female but identified as women were involved in that conference, invited to participate, but they wanted one woman-only session for female survivors of sexual abuse. And if ever there was an example of give an inch, take a mile, the way that those Manchester feminists were treated and punished for just wanting to protect that one small space reserved as female-only space, that, that speaks volumes about what's going on. And for me, that felt very personal because I owe my sanity and, you know, well, everything that I've been able to do in my life to women-only groups of female survivors of sexual abuse. And it was amongst women that I learned I wasn't alone, that it wasn't my fault, that I was entitled to feel angry, that my boundaries were important, that my truth and understanding of reality were believed and not the lies imposed on me and told by the man who abused me. I learned that my instincts to protect myself, which actually I had suppressed um, because I was in a situation where I, you know, no escape, uh, that those were actually good instincts to be trusted and I needed to recover those <coughs> instincts. And I needed women-only space to learn those lessons. I needed to be with women. In those groups, it mattered to us that we were all of the same sex. Not that we shared a letter on a driving licence or a reissued birth certificate, um, because, 
we were all of the same sex. And we are human animals and we can read sex. We do not... Sometimes that gets confused because of sexist stereotypes. And I am sure there are women in this room who sometimes are mistaken because of sexist stereotypes for men from time to time. But getting rid of the sexist stereotypes, humans can read sex. All of you clothed in this room, I don't need to see what you look like underneath your clothes. I know what sex you are, male, female, and I'm not interested in what's in your wallet. <laughs> Maybe at the bar later, but ID-wise, I'm not interested in what's in your wallet. So, in those groups it matters what sex people are. And I imagine myself at the age I was, when I left home, I left home at 16, and I was going to those groups at the age of 17. And I imagine myself at that age, plucking up the courage, after some months, to go to a meeting and finding myself sharing that space with someone who I perceive to be male, because they are physically male. And all those vital lessons about truth-telling, about boundaries, about trusting my instincts and speaking up, all of those lessons would have been undone in that moment. I would have been uncomfortable, and more than uncomfortable, and I would have had to be silent for fear of offending someone else's sensibility or sense of self. And those groups are groups where people go, women go, to be vulnerable with each other and to tell the truth to each other and to have this great big thing in the room that you can't say. Uh, so counterproductive, non-conducive to any kind of therapeutic space. So those uncomfortable, silenced feelings would have been very familiar from years of, from years of abuse and I would have been re-traumatised and I would not have gone back to that group. So when I saw those sorts of spaces being attacked and in some cases shut down, I was really shocked. Um, I just couldn't believe what was happening to women-only spaces in the name of trans rights. But then what was almost worse was that when I shared my concern about that to people that I knew, they thought this was a rather trivial and marginal issue. Um, well, there can't be very many of them. And, and also that some of my views were problematic. So problematic is one of those great words. It means I don't really have a, an argument to offer you, but I just, want to, I just want you to know that you're wrong. <laughs> so I was, I was repeatedly asking to justify why I needed those boundaries. And in fact, in that dynamic where you're asked why, why about your boundaries, why do you say no, um, there's something rather familiar about that dynamic, you know, being worn down by the repeated explanation. Our simple no is never taken as a complete sentence. Um, but no, that is a complete sentence. But also in those discussions, I started to connect with women who really did understand that sex is important and that our, our experience of sexism is about, is an embodied experience, and that sex is a material reality which has real social significance because we live in a sexist society. Um, so making those connections was vital. It stopped me feeling like I was the one who was mad and I understood that actually it was the world that had gone mad. <laughs> so, five, so five years later, after that first realisation and having that support from other women, but just we all knew that we weren't mad, it was the world that was mad, but we were talking to each other. But five years later this was still going on and in September of last year there was a meeting a bit like this, um, but with more drama, um, where the people who had organised that meeting had, had, had been kicked out of their venue and had to find a new venue. A woman was assaulted at Speaker's Corner. That woman is here in the room tonight. Thank you for coming. 
And the conversations I'd been having with other women coalesced and we decided that we had to start promoting these discussions openly, no matter how inhospitable <coughs> the terrain. So around the kitchen table, Women's Place UK came into being as a Twitter account, as a Facebook page. Um, more importantly, we brought together a set of ideas <coughs> we were prepared to fight for. You can read our launch statement. It's pinned at the top of our Twitter. And a commitment to do everything we can to ensure that sex-based rights and protect protections are retained and to make spaces like this where women's voices can be heard possible. And we won't lose. We won't lose this struggle because ours is a reality-based politics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's <laughs> and it's pitted against a politics that is steeped in sexism and which simply refuses to debate. And what we want is we want a way in which we can have sex-based rights and protections and <coughs> human rights for everybody including people who identify as trans and including people who are gender non-conforming and none of these things have to be in conflict but we are not prepared to cede and accommodate on women's rights. So our demands, they are very, very simple, they are incredibly reasonable, they are the most reasonable <laughs> demands that a hate group has ever come up with. <laughs> I understand we are called a hate group, I think we did take that seriously for the tape, we're not a hate group. <laughs> and our demands are that we want firstly respectful and evidence-based discussion on the impact of law change and that women's voices must be heard. What a scandal <laughs> that the transgender inquiry did not have verbal evidence from a single women's organisation when what they were discussing was the legal definition of sex. And that is something that particularly affects women who benefit from being you know, it, from the protective characteristic of sex in the Equality Act, but actually it's about every, you know, that affects everybody. And to think that this is a kind of side discussion that can be annexed to transgender lobby groups and not involve women's organisations, what a scandal. And we know what the discussion is like out there. It's absolutely toxic. As Raquel said, we have to raise the level of the debate and have calm, respectful, evidence-based discussions. So women's voices must be heard, they will be heard, they are being heard. We're being, I think we're being moderately, cautiously, but I think we're being a bit successful. <laughs> you know, tonight we're being heard. And this idea that there is no debate, sometimes hashtag no debate, you know, it won't wash. That debate, the, fact, the right to have that debate, is supported by the Leader of the Opposition, mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. It's supported by Amber Rudd, who, is, who now has the brief for women and equalities, when she says she's watching very carefully the Women's Aid Review on single-sex employment. It's supported by the former Women and Equalities Minister, Justine Greening, when she says it's very important now that women's voices must be heard. <laughs> oh, I wrote this bit when I thought there'd be some people outside. <laughs> I'll say it anyway. If there, if there are some students who want to wear balaclavas and shout at us, you know, let them get on with it. They are telling us what they are. But reasonable people know there is a debate to be had about sex-based rights and gender identity and how those two things might relate and the problem when gender identity starts to muddy sex-based rights. Our second demand, the principle of women-only spaces to be upheld and where necessary extended. So this is what got me into this thing really. Um, 
At the weekend, it was announced that Women's Aid is reviewing its policy on the use of exemptions for um, employment. Now, Women's Aid doesn't run services directly, but its guidance is very influential, and it's particularly influential on commissioners of services. If Women's Aid guidance says it's fine for people who will be perceived as male, because they are physically male, so if it's fine for them to work in refuges housing vulnerable women fleeing male violence, then the commissioners of those services, local authorities and so on, will follow their lead. And if we understand one thing about women's lives, it's that the person who controls the finances has the power. This is why <coughs> universal credit is such a disaster for women, puts them at the mercy of abusive partners. And it's the same when we look at government funding, commissioners, service providers, at the bottom, the service users. What say do the service users have in this? Service users, I say, that's a euphemism, isn't it? Service users. Women fleeing abusive, violent relationships. Women arriving, as Carolyn Gala Smith said on the TV, women arriving at the door of refuge, sometimes just wearing the clothes they have on them. They are subject to a postcode lottery, really. What, does, what decision has the local service provider chosen to make about the use of exemptions? So this is why um, it's not enough to just say, well, the Equality Act exemptions will remain in place. Because in order for the exemptions to actually benefit the people they're designed to benefit, women, they have to be used. Exemptions which are not usable because organisations have been told, misled, that they can only be used in the very most extreme circumstances, those sorts of exemptions are not usable at all. If they're to, if they're to benefit women, they have to be usable. And that's why we have our third demand, which is a review of how Equality Act exemptions are being applied now to ensure that women's needs are met. <coughs> because we have a lot of examples that come from women, come to us with stories about the way that their needs are not being met. And there are ways in which those exemptions could be strengthened and extended. We could put in place an equality duty or the need to do an impact assessment if you chose not to use those exemptions, for example. <coughs> At the moment, it's very unequal. If you choose to use the exemptions, you have to demonstrate that they are, that they are legitimate. If you don't choose the exemptions, you don't have to say anything about the impact on the most vulnerable women. And we need a, this more bottom-up approach, which really puts women in the seat of those services at the centre and not giving all the power to the commissioners of services. And this relates to the way in which what is actually a proposed law of self-identification is actually creeping in ahead of the law. This issue of how are exemptions being used, because it's very important that we are able to make a distinction in law between women as a sex and people who may have acquired a legally recognised gender or may not have acquired a legally recognised gender. <coughs> Um, and are not female. It's very important that we are able to make this distinction because it matters for women's safety and lives. Mm -hmm. 